Sencha, Bancha, Hojicha, Kukicha, Kabusecha, Yokuro. Let's look at the most prevalent kinds of Japanese tea. Hi tea friends, this is Elsa with Nanuoshan, where we share in the pleasure of drinking and discovering genuine farm teas. If you're new to our channel, welcome. We hope that you'll learn a little bit more about tea and maybe accumulate some new brewing techniques. If you're new to our channel, please don't forget to subscribe. And if you like what you're seeing, we do hope you'll give us a thumbs up. So today we're going to do a little Japanese Tea 101 by looking more closely at the most popular kinds of Japanese teas that you're likely to encounter on your tea journey. Now, please keep in mind that this list is by no means exhaustive and that you probably will one day be face to face with some other kinds of Japanese teas, but these are the ones that people talk about the most or think about the most when they're considering Japanese tea. So a good first way to begin categorizing our Japanese teas is by thinking about the cultivation process because all Japanese teas fall into one of two categories. They are either non-shaded, so falling into the roji tea category, or they are shaded, which is the kabuse cultivation category. So the roji or unshaded teas are teas such as sensha, bansha, hojicha, and the shaded teas are your kabusecha, gyokuro, matcha, and kukicha is a tea which can fall into either categories depending on the material that it was originally made with. So keeping in mind that shading is a process which is both quite time consuming, expensive, um, as well as not ideal for the plant, it does put a stress on the plant. So why would farmers go to the hassle of this lengthy process? Well, the, the reason has to do with the flavor. The flavor profile is actually quite different whether you are looking at shaded or non-shaded teas. So, why is that? In wanting to understand that more, we should actually take a step back and look at two compounds which are responsible for prevalent flavor notes in Japanese teas. So, when the tea plant um, is being cultivated in a non-shaded process, the plant in its roots develops an amino acid called L-theanine. L-theanine then travels up through the branches, out through the stems, and into the leaves, where under the sunshine, the L-theanine is converted during photosynthesis into catechins. And catechins are um, a kind of polyphenol a, um, an antioxidant, which is actually responsible for many of the wonderful health benefits of green tea, but which comes with a rather astringent flavor note. Whereas L-theanine, so this original component that the tea plant was creating, has these savory, sweet flavor notes. So when farmers decide to shade their tea plant, what they're actually doing is interrupting this photosynthesis step. And by doing so, they are preserving more of these L-theanine savory sweet flavor notes of the tea plants. Interestingly enough, this step in tea processing was only discovered relatively recently. Um, I mean, I say relatively in the 1830s, um, but when you think about the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of tea production in Japan, this is actually relatively recent. And basically what happened was farmers realized that the plants which were being shaded, whether by the tea, by taller trees near the tea plant or by umbrellas being used to protect the plant from frost, it was realized that actually the flavor was completely different. And so 
tea types kind of branched off into these two different categories. But so today let's actually take a step back and we'll start with our non-shaded teas. So probably the kind of Japanese tea that you've all heard the most about is sencha. So about 80% of Japanese teas fall into the sencha categories. The word sencha means simmered tea, and it's probably one of the most widely consumed kinds of Japanese teas. So the plant is grown under direct sunlight. It can then be harvested, um, and Japanese teas in general can be harvested in about three different harvest seasons. So there is the springtime harvest, extremely celebrated extremely high quality, the most flavor, flavorful teas will come during the spring harvest. And then there is also a summer harvest. And then we also have an autumn harvest. Um, teas of high, the highest qualities might only be harvested once a year. The tea plant might be let um, to sort of incubate these flavor profiles during the whole year within just one harvest, the springtime harvest, the shinsha harvest. Whereas farmers who are trying to produce as much tea as possible might even do up to four harvests. Um, and then in the unshaded tea production, the tea is harvested and it undergoes this process which we discussed a little bit in one of our previous videos but so basically the plant is steamed to stop oxidation and then it undergoes a series of um, rolling and drying steps which then create the Japanese tea characteristic um, visual appearance of a slender needle-like um, shape where one leaf is basically one needle. So this is what sencha most typically looks like. It's usually harvested in the spring or in the summer and it's known for having these very grassy, very vegetal um, flavor notes. It can have astringency and it has this vivid green, almost um, fluorescent glow when you steep it. Of the two different tea categories, so our shaded kabuse and our non-shaded roji teas, the roji teas are less delicate. So actually when you're brewing them, you can go with slightly higher water temperatures than you would with the shaded trees like gyokuro or kabusecha. So essentially you can brew at about 80 degrees Celsius. Um, and you can also, so doing shorter steeps with the Japanese teas we will often go for um, one minute steep, sometimes even less, 30 second steeps, and you can do multiple steeps. And what's really great about sencha teas is that you can also play around with the different water temperatures. So, you know, we've talked about how these unshaded teas do have more of those naturally astringent flavor profiles, but if you don't like that astringency, you can lower the water temperature a little bit to 70, or if on the contrary you do like it, then you can actually increase the water temperature to, you know, even 90 degrees, and then more of that astringency and caffeine, which comes with bitterness, will come out. So, the other kind of tea, which is made, which is processed in the exact same way of sencha, but which is actually made with lower quality leaves, is bansha. So bansha is what is, um, so it's usually the one of the cheapest of the Japanese green teas. It's very, very commonly drank. You can find it all over Japan as a sort of daily consumption household tea. And that one is often made with either a later harvest. Um, so for example, an autumn harvest. It can be made with the leaves which were harvested in the pruning steps of the tea plant. Or what can also sometimes happen is when sencha is being made, one of the final steps is a sorting process, which separates the finer, thinner, higher quality 
leaves, which were made from the top buds, the youngest shoots of the tea plant, from sort of coarser, thicker, larger, duller tea leaves, which those were, these are made from lower leaves, which the harvesting machine did gather at the same time as the younger, more delicate buds. And these leaves are then gathered together for bansha. Bansha is more affordable. It also has more astringency. It has a bit of a rougher taste, um, more of this bitterness that we were, astringency that we were talking about. Um, and as a result, bansha is therefore also used for some of the other teas which we might encounter. So a lot of the um, flavored teas that are on the market are made with these later harvest bansha style teas because the flavor of the leaves themselves is less important because aromas are then added to the leaves. Um, but bansha can also go really well for genmaicha, which is a kind of Japanese tea with um, the puffed rice in it, which you've perhaps encountered. Or bansha is also really frequently used for um, hojicha. So hojicha is the roasted kind of Japanese tea. Interestingly enough, when you look at it, it does look like a brown tea, but it is actually still a green tea that has simply been roasted at the end of the process. So this roasting occurs for a couple of different reasons. Often it's a tea which wouldn't have been so flavorful, maybe because of the time of harvest or the quality of the harvest. And so this roasting will bring out some of these nuttier, slightly more caramelized, more earthy, sweeter notes. Um, because of that, I actually often recommend hojicha as a good transitional tea for people who are looking to step away from coffee but still like that sort of um, darker, roasted, earthier flavor profile of coffee. You can find some notes that are reminiscent of that in hojicha. Um, and another great thing about hojicha is that as it undergoes this roasting process, a lot of the caffeine evaporates. So actually caffeine evaporates at 178 degrees Celsius and the hojicha is roasted at about 200 degrees Celsius. So that makes it a tea which is really great for people who want to drink a tea in the evening, for example, but are worried about consuming too much caffeine. It also makes it a good choice for the elderly or people when they're feeling a bit sick and they want something warm, but they can't handle too much caffeine. Um, and actually, I might have already shared this story, but when I was doing my internship in Wazuka in Japan, very often in the morning you would open up the window and just on the road tea was being roasted and there was just this incredibly delicious caramelized smell in the air, really addicting, really fabulous. Um, and so hojicha is also um, a tea which is often served in restaurants. It's very easy to pair with, with different foods. And also, just like our sencha and our bancha, um, less delicate, less finicky, so you can steep it easily at 80 degrees for two minutes, three minutes. Um, it's less, um, less bitter because it has less of this caffeine in it. So an easy, an easy brew for beginners. So then we're going to slowly transition into our shaded tea category. And we're going to do that by looking more closely at kukicha, which can either be made from um, plants which were shaded or which were not shaded. So kukicha is actually also known as twig tea or stem tea because it is made of the twigs and stems which were harvested with 
the tea leaves, but which are separated from the leaves during processing. So for a long time, this byproduct was actually discarded at the end of the um, processing, but then people realized, well, wait a minute, it's actually quite flavorful and quite delicious and can have this incredibly sweet flavor profile. And so now you can actually find uh, really fabulous kukichas on the market. Um, you can even find a kind of kukicha made from shaded uh, gyokuro, and this is called karigani kukicha. Um, you find it a lot in uh, Kyoto, actually. And interestingly, because L-theanine, so as we were saying, L-theanine is um, uh, generated by the plant in the roots and then travels up through the branches and into the stems. So actually, stem teas are often very high in L-theanine, giving them more of this sweetness, savoriness, and soothing attributes. Um, as well as having less caffeine within them um, because the caffeine is created in the leaves for the, the tea plant to protect its youngest, its youngest, most delicate buds. So, and I would even specifically say that Karigane Kukicha um, can be incredibly umami filled, incredibly savory, and I often drink it in the summer as a cold brew. It makes for a really brothy, um, thick, and just fabulously cooling summer summer drink. So I recommend that one. So. Transitioning into our shaded teas, we will then look at kabuse cha. So kabuse, as a reminder, is the word for shaded, and cha just means tea. So kabuse cha is a tea which is processed in the same way as sencha, but which undergoes about a week or 10 days of shading before harvest. And this shading does some of this photosynthesis interruption that we were talking about to kind of increase the, the umami notes. Um, however, of course, the, the king of umami teas in Japan is gyokuro. So gyokuro, which means precious dew, is really considered by all Japanese um, tea lovers to be the pinnacle of Japanese tea. For gyokuro, the tea plant is shaded for approximately 20 days before harvest. It can be a bit more or less depending on the farmer or the region. And because of this shading, the, the flavor profile is incredibly umami filled. So we still have these very grassy and vegetal notes, but there's just this added complexity, almost nori seaweed-like um, flavorness to it. It is tea which can be extremely expensive. You can find um, the, the most, uh, uh, impressive gyokuros in Japan are harvested by hand, they might even be processed by hand, um, and they can be incredibly, incredibly expensive. If you find the shinsha gyokuros, the, the first gyokuros of the season, these are really, really true Japanese treats. Um, and the last, and oh, and this kind of tea so Sencha was developed in Uji in 1738, and then a hundred years later, Gyokuro was discovered or developed um, in 1836. So interesting to, to see how that sort of tea trajectory evolved over time. Um, I think a lot of times our the flavors that we're seeking out in Japanese tea can also evolve over time. I know for a long time I found umami very overwhelming and overpowering, and I preferred that astringency of sensha. And then over time, I've now moved on and do really relish that umami um, savoriness. But different people are looking for different things. Um, 
Important to note that when you are steeping gyokuro and kabusecha, those are much more delicate teas than hojicha, bansha, and even sencha. So with those teas, you really want to make sure that you have cooled your water down to about 60 degrees Celsius um, in order to not burn the leaves and also in order to bring out those umami notes but not bring out that astringency bitterness which might overpower those more delicate flavors. So, and with gyokuro, you can actually, so if you've lowered the water temperature to about 60 degrees, um, and as a reminder, I mentioned this in a previous video, but a good way to know if your water is at a good temperature for your tea, if you don't have a thermometer or a kettle which can adjust the water temperature, but is to hold your tea pot or your, your whatever, uh, uh, if you're using a kyusu or a hohin, and if you can hold the water in there without burning your hands for about four to five seconds, five seconds, then you're at the 60 degrees Celsius mark. So, and then, however, with gyokuro, you can steep it a bit longer. So, for example, two, two to three minutes will bring out more and more of that sweetness while keeping the bitterness at bay because the water is cooler. Um, now, these are not the only kinds of Japanese teas which exist out there. There are um, Japanese white teas, there are Japanese oolongs, there are Japanese black teas. You can even find post-fermented dark teas in Japan, as Gabrielle and our good friend Noli have um, done a video about, which I highly recommend. But this is just a start of understanding some of the names which you might encounter. So thank you very much for watching. I hope that this was informative. Again, please don't forget to hit subscribe and do give us a thumbs up. Thank you very much. Bye.